Um, thank you all for joining and thank you very much for your patience. Um, I'm going to stand right here so that uh, the people on Zoom can hear me. So my apologies uh, to the people in the back if you can't see me very well. Um, but I appreciate you all coming out today. I know this is getting to the end of the semester. Um, what I'll be presenting today is my book project, which now is under contract at Cambridge University Press, that looks at how non-democracies manage participation and its consequences for regime durability. Um, so this book primarily focuses on the case of Russia, but I know we have a, an eclectic mix of audience here, so I'm going to keep it relatively broad and speak mostly about the general arguments and ideas that I am talking about in the book. So today, nearly every country in the world promotes some form of citizen engagement and participation in politics. This can take a variety of forms. Um, so for example, in my main case of the book, Russia, every year they hold this program called The Direct Line with Vladimir Putin which is this call-in show where Putin essentially picks up the phone and takes calls from people around Russia and discusses the issues of the day. Uh, this broadcast is very reminiscent of a similar program in Venezuela under Hugo Chavez called Allo Presidente, um, which was a weekly talk show that would last for oftentimes hours and hours, if not all day, um, and allowed Venezuelans to express grievances directly to Chavez. Kazakhstan similarly, has a very sophisticated electronic government system where users can uh, interact with the government in a variety of ways. They can um, submit complaints to the government about particular issues that they have. They can submit requests for help. They can uh, ask for consultations on proposed policies and even talk directly with ministers and government officials through their blogs. And then just finally, one last example, China also has a variety of these types of interactions, from the very infamous letters and visits office to mayor's mailboxes, and my personal favorite, a program called Share Your Thoughts with Premier Li, which as you can see here, allows people to type questions and complaints directly to the premier, and then he then receives these and answers a handful live on the air. And so these are all examples of what I call participatory technologies. So participatory technologies um, is essentially just elite mass communication strategies that specifically foster two-way interaction between citizens and their leaders, right? And these participatory technologies, as I showed, are very widely used around the world. But their proliferation in authoritarian regimes in particular has not resulted, as maybe some early observers had hoped, in the consolidation of democracy. Rather, they have become tools and instruments of authoritarian control. So in the book, I ask three main questions. First, why do authoritarian regimes bother spending the time, the money, and the resources to develop these channels of communication and participation? What benefits do they actually afford regimes? Second, I then try to ask, are these tactics actually effective? Do they work and under what conditions? And then finally, what are their limitations? Are there any drawbacks for regimes? And to answer these questions, uh, we need to first take a step back a bit and consider the types of challenges that authoritarian regimes face from below, from the masses. Two of the most onerous of these are managing information and building legitimacy. So I just wanna go through these very briefly and what I mean. So first off, managing information, what do I mean by that? So accurate, free-flowing information is a necessary condition for long-term regime st uh, stability and durability. The more information that governments have about society, the more able they are to identify areas of concern before discontent boils over and becomes potentially destabilizing. But in non-democracies, where there is that ever-present threat of repression, people are not necessarily incentivized to be truthful about their true attitudes. And so for that reason, authoritarian regimes oftentimes appear to be quite stable right up into the point when they are not. So that's the first uh, problem that authoritarian regimes have to deal with from the masses. The second is building legitimacy. That is convincing people that the existing order is right and proper to use Lipsitz terminology. So when regimes have high levels of legitimacy, they face lower risk of protest and popular rebellion, even because citizens you know, are generally more accepting of the regime's right to govern, even if there are some you know, disagreements on the margins, so to speak. And so these two problems are very uh, closely intertwined in what we call the dictator's dilemma, right? Building engaging perceptions and attitudes of the government requires a really detailed knowledge about society, about what people are thinking and concerned about. But without information about society, it becomes difficult to make decisions that can increase legitimacy. 
So you have this kind of circular issue at work here. So, yeah. Another cost of that is manage and promote. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, way you, the, the way you talked about it sounded like the people had thoughts. Mm -hmm. And are the they manage, how does the elite's decision to, to kind of give information out? How is mm -hmm. that affected by? I just didn't understand that your description of that. Yeah. I think I would stop. Sure, absolutely. So what I mean by managing information, why this is a problem for authoritarian regimes, is authoritarian regimes need to understand what people are thinking. What are their concerns? What are the avenues that people could potentially go and maybe protest about or otherwise could destabilize the regime? So I'm trying to figure out how does the government uh, gather information about society about these concerns? Does that answer your question? Okay, great. And I'll talk about the, the different ways that I see this at work um, and with these participatory technologies in the book. So hopefully that'll clarify it a bit more. Perfect. Okay, um, so these two, as I talk about these two problems um, are very onerous for authoritarian regimes. And so the question I think then becomes is how do authoritarian regimes balance between this need for information about society and the way to control this information on one hand and then support on the other? So how do they actually end up balancing this? So I argue um, in the book that participatory technologies serve as one of the tools of, in the authoritarian regime's menu of manipulation, so to speak. So the main argument very briefly um, is thus. So by providing opportunities for non-electoral forms of participation and otherwise what are quite closed political systems, Participatory technologies can strengthen the flow of vertical information, that is, between citizens and the government and vice versa, and demonstrate, or at least attempt to demonstrate to citizens that authorities are attentive to their needs, concerns, and the overall mood of society. And I think that participatory technologies are particularly useful in this regard because they give uh, regimes a lot of control over the accepted modes of participation, like what participation actually looks like without having a lot of constraints of the formal institutions. So I'll show you what I mean by this throughout the process, but they essentially allow authoritarian regimes to simulate some type of accountability, some type of responsiveness, without leading necessitating, uh, necessitating uh, responsiveness at a systematic or systemic level. So they were what uh, Lucy would call elite enabling participation. And again, I'll show you what I mean by that throughout the presentation. Finally, I show that by promoting such strategies, authoritarian regimes are trying to encourage the masses to believe that ha they have some genuine role in the political process, that citizens have the opportunity, should they wish to exercise this opportunity, to actively communicate with government officials their needs, concerns, um, problems, and anything else that they might need. Um, this is what RDD would call virtual immediacy. So this is the overall argument of the book. And I substantiate these arguments um, through a very much a mixed methods approach. Um, so I started with uh, the theory building part of this exercise of both 20 months of ethnographic fieldwork, primarily in Russia, but also in Kazakhstan through participant observation and semi-structured interviews, as well as a detailed case study of Russia, um, which I'll go into detail today. I then look and I test a lot of the arguments in the book um, through two original nationally representative surveys with embedded experiments, as well as a series of um, semi-structured interviews and focus groups. So I'll be drawing primarily on the case study, as well as some of the survey evidence and interviews today in the talk. So just a very brief overview. As I said, I'm, I'm, the goal of this presentation today is kind of to give you a broad overview of the main arguments. So I'm gonna talk about the different varieties of participatory technologies I've seen at work, um, primarily through the case of Russia. And then I'm gonna go into more detail about these arguments on information management and authoritarian legitimation. Okay, so let's start by discussing the different varieties of participatory technologies. So as I showed at the beginning of this presentation, um, they can take a number of different forms and different political contexts. In the book, I identify main, uh, three main what I call varieties of them. To be clear, um, these are not exhaustive, right? But rather they're here to give us an idea about how participatory technologies actually look like in practice. So the first of these are appeal systems through which individuals can complain directly to officials in the hopes of bring, uh, resolving specific individualized problems. Um, now, I think it's important to point out that even though participatory technologies has the word technology in that, these are not new 
phenomenon by any means. By technology, I mean very much innovation. Um, so for the Russianists in the room, this is I borrowed this and developed this term from political technologies. Um, in fact, we've seen uh, something along these lines of appeal system as far back in the Russian Empire, um, um, back in the days of petitioning the czar. So as you can see on the left hand of your screen here, this is a photo of the workman's position, uh, petition to uh, Tsar Nicholas on Bloody Sunday. In the Soviet Union, this changed a bit, became uh, the complaint system. And today in the modern, um, like modern area, we've seen a proliferation of online appeal systems um, throughout the country where people can go online through a website or maybe check their phone in an app and make complaints and um, talk to the government about particular issues. There, these are two examples of them. The first is called Dobrodel, meaning literally good works or good deeds. Uh, their tagline is solving problems together, together meaning the government and citizens. Um, another one uh, specifically for the, the city of Moscow um, called Nashgorod, our, our city. Um, these are just two examples, although we've seen them throughout the country. So in the follow-up to the book, um, I'm really interested in kind of diving deeper into these appeal systems to see like, what are the types of issues that people are talking about? How is the government responding and things along those lines? The second type, the second variety that I look at in the book are called uh, our public consultations, where the public is allowed to provide feedback on draft regulations, policies, laws, and the sort. I mean, otherwise inform authorities about their opinions on these particular issues in the public domain. The most famous of these in Russia is called the Civic Chamber, which acts as kind of almost an intermediary by allowing people to um, consult with the government directly. Um, but there's also been a variety of these initiatives um, that have occurred throughout Russia. Um, so for a while, they had something called the Open Government Initiative, which has more recently become this federal portal of draft regulations that holds public discussions on draft laws so that people can provide direct feedback on laws before they become, um, before bills before they become law. And the final variety that I discuss in the book are government blogs and call-in shows. So the government blog very much had its heyday in Russia under former president Dmitry Medvedev, who was president from 2009 to 2012. He was a very verbally, at least, an advocate of direct online communication between citizens and authorities. Um, at one point, actually, he actually told governors that if they did not set up an interactive blog with their constituents, that they could be removed from their positions. So something that he at least thought was very important to conveying this message. So when Putin returned to the presidency in 2012, he is famously technophobic, does not like using the computer. Um, he undermined this initiative of government blogs, but instead we've seen a proliferation of their very close cousin, the call-in show. Um, the fam most famous of which is this direct line program um, that I uh, showed you at the very beginning of the presentation. So I'm actually thinking about using this photo as my uh, book cover. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and if you like it or not. Um, so a little bit about the direct line. So the direct line began in 2001 and has continued pretty much annually to this year, only missing four different times, which in 2004, 2012, 20, and 22. Um, it's very interesting why, and I'd be happy to talk about that a little more in the Q&A. So as you can see in this photo, so we have Putin here in the foreground um, with the two hosts of the program. And in the couple of weeks prior to the broadcast and throughout the four to five hour broadcast, it lasts quite a long time, uh, people can pick up the phone and call into the call center, which you can see in the back there, send text messages, video recording, or go to um, one of the many uh, places around the country where they have people live, allowing people to ask questions. And so over the course of the program, Putin is uh, talking directly with citizens and answering their specific individualized questions that they have. And what's interesting about this program, I think in many ways is that it's, it's very popular, um, interestingly enough. In its very first year of broadcast, so in, in 2001, about 70% of all adult Russians stated that they watched at least some of the program, 70%. While this has gone down over time as it's become more routinized, and I'll, I'll talk about the consequences of that later, it's still very well known, quite popular. 
about 45% of Russians say that they watch at least some of it live. Um, so this figure is from a survey I conducted in 2016, but we've seen this, this 45% be about average for the years that have come past. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. But how do you address the concern that these direct lines for, I guess, the past years yeah. were 100% sure staged and orchestrated? Absolutely, they are 100%, right? I'll talk about that a little bit. But so over the course of the broadcast, every year they say that they um, receive between two to three million questions. This number is most likely fabricated. I do know there is plenty of evidence that shows that people do call in, probably not two to three million though. Um, that's actually not a problem, right? This is one of the benefits of participatory technologies is that they give the government control over what types of issues are discussed and how issues are discussed. This is absolutely pre-planned. The questions that they choose could maybe not even be real at all. And so that gives them the ability to say, here is how we are going to discuss these problems. But the question then becomes, and what is the question I try to answer, is how does this actually work then? Do people actually buy into this or are they dismissing it because they know it's staged? Yeah. I mean, related to that, like a law president, you know, plays weekly. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say, you know, yeah. the fact that this happens once a year, mm -hmm. I think would seem to make it is very obviously a performance. Yeah. As opposed to a challenge which you would generally gather mm -hmm. information from the public. Yeah. So if citizens know this is pure performance, mm -hmm. there's no truthful information, yeah. what is that? Okay for your argument yeah. about the signal it's sending. So first off, I show that uh, that is not actually the case. That a significant portion of the population actually do view this as communication, and I'll show you um, this in the rest of the presentation. So I actively test that. But moreover, the government does takes a number of steps to increase its credibility. Um, one of the things that they do do is because like the concern, if this is only happening once a year, how, like why does this matter? People might be a big fan, maybe if they buy into it, are a big fan when it happens, but then they're not thinking about it 364 other days of the year, right? So one of the things that they do, the government does, is they are constantly referring back to the direct line. You will see headlines saying, you know, the potholes in Omsk region have been filled because this was an issue that was brought up in the direct line. Putin himself refers back to it constantly in his other speeches. Um, and so it's something that the government actually brings up consistently throughout the year to keep reminding people that this is something that happens, that they care about them. They're listening. They're taking that into account and solving their problems. Yeah. But I think that that is a concern. And that the idea of this being just propaganda is a question I really try to get at. And I'll show you shortly. Yeah. But in response to that question, like, can I give you I think are they mostly national level issues that people call up and ask mm -hmm. Putin about? Because why would you call up and ask Putin to fix the potholes? Yeah. Like, I'm just curious as to yeah. this, the types of information that has been conveyed. Yeah, I can show you the breakdown of different types of questions at the end of the presentation if you're interested. But the most of these, I would say more of them than not, um, are actually these individualized issues. They are, I didn't get my pension. Um, the, we need to have the pothole filled, all of these kind of very individualized issues. This is kind of the point. So one of the arguments that I, I'm going to show you today is that one of the things that the direct line is trying to convey is this image of Putin as a listener, as a problem solver. It's trying to convey the image that he's basically the only one fixing the issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so that if there's problems going on, it's not his fault. It's the fault of the corrupt lower level um, mm -hmm. officials. And so this is exactly the point, is it allows them to address these very small individualized issues that don't take much resources and say, hey, look, we solved this, we filled those potholes, but it doesn't lead to any, necessarily lead to any systemic change. It doesn't lead to better infrastructure, less corruption and, and, and infrastructure spending. And that gives uh, government a lot of leeway in what they're able to do. Yeah, I'm curious. Isn't there a similar interest mm -hmm. in that? If, if I realize that we need to get the ball over my yard fixed, it, yeah. to be selected of one out of three million calls that I make, yeah. that, you know, we live in a pretty bad system. Right? Yeah. That's the only way of fixing things, right? And that, that should sort of force you to make inference mm -hmm. in a very negative direction towards the kind of system you live in where fixing things is just extremely difficult. Yeah. They, they have to be done quickly than the most more sensible like working with workplace on institutions. 
So two things. First off, the, uh, the organizers do try to mitigate this. So they say one of the things they try to emphasize is that we're only answering 80 or so questions by, um, today, but we are paying attention to every single issue. So that's one of the reasons they bring it up throughout the year. Putin also holds um, post uh, direct line meetings with governors to be like, here is the packet of all the questions that came from your region. You solve them now, we're paying attention. Um, that being said, this is still a problem. And right, and one of the things I look at are what are the limitations of these technologies? And this is very much a limitation. One of the things I'm gonna show you today is that over time, when people are seeing, we had a pothole question last year, and we had a pothole question 10 years ago, potholes are not being filled. This actually leads to backlash against the regime when people start to like find, figure out that things are not actually changing as a result. And so that is one of the major limitations, which I'll get to, Sasha. So maybe, so they, you know, that was a good um, question, but they did adopt a format of a certain point where all of the governors had to be available for like the media yeah. to be like, Video chatted in so people yeah. like immediately yell at them about the platform. Yep. <laughs> 2017. It's great. It's fantastic. I'm <laughs> really impressed with that. Yeah. Can you look at that separately and how it affected people's like protects Putin's approval while mm -hmm. claiming that governors for the problem. So I wasn't able to directly test that aspect of like, yeah, them him publicly chastising in the um governors. Um so that would be something very interesting to do. Um, I try to get at it through non-like survey um, ways through my interviews. Um, so not quite as systematic uh, as some of my other approaches, um, but I do address that through interviews in the book, yes. So so anyways, going back to kind of this, this uh, table here, um, one of the things that makes this important and makes this a, a good avenue for this kind of conversation, as silly as it may seem to some of us in this room, is that Every, essentially everybody knows about it, right? 45% are watching at least some of the broadcast, but only 1% has never heard of it before. So I want to put this, these figures a little bit into perspective. So looking at that 45%, right? That's kind of the average viewer, um, viewership now. By comparison, Putin's two other big addresses every year. So his um, annual address to the Federal Assembly, which is essentially Russia's State of the Union for all intents and purposes and his uh, popular press conference that he does every year, they get on average between 8 to 25% viewership at best. So this is well over double. People are much more interested in this. And moreover, as I pointed out, virtually everybody has heard of the direct line. Only 1% of my respondents say that they did not. Um, so it is something that people are aware of, even if they are not paying attention to. In fact, um, in uh, open-ended questions, Russians have repeatedly mentioned the direct line as being one of the most important events that happens in the world on an average year. It's beat out at various times Brexit, the World Cup, and their own elections. <laughs> um, so I, the question is, like, is this just propaganda for people? For some, but not for everybody. And I think that's a very, very important point to make, which I will try to do. In fact, I'll try to do that right now. <laughs> um, so what sets, why are people so interested in the direct line, right? Why are they thinking it's more important than Brexit and their own elections? Well, I think what sets per, uh, the direct line and other participatory technologies apart from like, you know, your average speech or news conference or what have you, is that the uh, organizers are actively trying to show that this is a credible and genuine form of voice, that it is specifically a dialogue between the highest leader of the land and average citizens, and that it is a way that uh, the government can get feedback about what they're doing from their constituents. So it is portrayed as a way of people being able to get their issues and concerns addressed and to receive feedback and information from, from the leader, as I mentioned. Um, and so in the book, I go through a lot of detail about the different ways that the government tries to make this credible, some of the things that I discuss, but this is something that comes up a lot in my interviews is people saying, yeah, you know, actually it is a way for Putin to know about problems from the source and not just from, you know, his underlings who are incentivized not to actually say much, right? So that everybody can give, come in and give a, their opinion, the very democratic way of talking to the government in a way that they, doesn't exist otherwise, right? But the concern as you rightly direct, um, addressed, hold on, let me get rid of this so you can see, 
is that maybe some people are just dismissing this simply as propaganda, right? It's that not everybody is buying into this narrative, right? This is Russia, right? An authoritarian regime where genuine pluralism and participation is very much constrained more now than ever. And so we would expect that some people are gonna look at this and be like, this is obviously staged, right? It is a circus with staged questions simply to get Putin points from society. So this is the tension, right? Between some people who are like, yeah, this, this is great. I can actually talk to Putin. People are like, no, this is obviously false. So one of the kind of what I try to get in the book is like, okay, what is that divide? Who are the people that buy into it? Who are the people thinking it's propaganda? And does it actually work at all in influencing how people think? of their political process, of um, Putin and their own, and their own um, political efficacy. So, but to take a little bit of a step back, right? I argue that the benefit of these participatory technologies is things like the direct line um, is twofold. First off, they help the government manage information about society. I'll go through each of these and then help with this legitimation problem. So let's dive into this information management that we talked a little bit about earlier. The first uh, benefit I, I identify as from the participatory technologies is that they're a way for the government to gather information about specific concerns and problems faced by society. In other words, they can help act as a barometer of public opinion. Yes, you have a question. Let me jump in here. I was yeah. just wondering if, like, you had another hypothesis, right? You had another hypothesis that I think you outlined before, mm -hmm. which is that you were trying to signal to your underlings. Yes. Yeah. That you have ways of getting information about yeah. performance directly from constituents. Yeah. So you were sort of telling them, actually, I'm watching you. I'm mm -hmm. cultivating direct sources of information about your performance from other people. Yeah. So that seems like another hypothesis about what could be driving that. So I was just yeah. wondering if you know, like you the leader maybe more I think he's unhappy with um how the underlings are performing in the mm -hmm. area, he may be more likely to get questions from that area. Mm -hmm. Like, like, is that another hypothesis about like functioning, which is a bit separate from the information gathering and the decision development? So it's, I consider it part of the information management story. It's kind of the second part of the information story. So this has multiple benefits, right? On one hand, you're getting a lot of information about citizens. On the other hand, this is a really great way to help overcome the principal agent problem, right? Because you are getting information from citizens that go right up to the top, you're bypassing all the people, the officials in the middle, who are incentivized not to be truthful about what they're doing, who may be corrupt, who may just be inept and not being doing a very good way of uh, doing a good job um, at what they're doing. And so this is absolutely one of the benefits that I discuss is that it acts as a monitoring and accountability tool of officials. So, the driver of it wouldn't be mm -hmm. like the way you pitch yeah. that thing is the driver of getting the information, mm -hmm. but maybe getting the information is not the motivation. The motivation is to get yeah. your underlings to be more loyal and to do your, you know, so it's not the information is just a way of doing that to get it, you know, it's about yeah. the driver, the nexus of that. So I, I, I don't think this is an either or situation, right? I think this is very much a situation where there are multiple things at play and it can solve multiple concerns. It can help deal with this problem of information about, you know, from the masses, but it can also one of the main major components, which I, which I talk about in detail, is this kind of aspect of being able to monitor um, the officials. So I see this as very much as complementary, um, not as antagonistic in any way. Yes. Can I ask you about the mechanism? Yeah. Yeah. So with the idea that, I mean, only 80 calls are aired, mm -hmm. so it's not really in all our window for Yeah. So with the idea that there is a team sifting through all the calls and like a reporting back to superior authorities or okay, yes, so that's actually a person that's happening and then they report the area to two things. That's yeah, that's what they say. Is that so while we, the viewers, only see 80 questions, the organizers, the government themselves is getting millions allegedly every year. And so one of the things they explicitly state and that they show throughout the year is that they are taking these questions, they're identifying. What are the major issues? Where are the issues coming from? What are the, who are the uh, officials doing a particularly bad job at this? And then that they address these throughout the year. So even though we are only seeing on the broadcast a handful, the input that they are getting that we are not seeing is much greater than that. I mean, it's actually being prompted from military. That's what we are told. And there is some evidence of that between the, the meetings that Poon has after the fact. He has this green folder 
this Zillion Hypotheca that everybody is afraid of, that he has this big stack of information. And then they release various like uh, statements throughout the year. We address this problem that was uh, brought up during the direct line, not on the broadcast, but asked. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that it's good to win situations more than one level up? And that the people who sit through the three million mm -hmm. boards might boast in the different information at the end of the day, still in the same environment as you were before. So you get some some signal, but then it gives this quote that again to the very same process that motivated the private strategies and then important systems. So it could, but the presidential administration personally handles this. So it, it's Dimitri Peskov, uh, Putin's spokesperson, that is the person in charge of the direct line that is handling this directly. Um, um, that is the purpose. So we have sort of given back to the English question with the publicity aspect of it. Oh, yeah. Very okay. important, right? Because if it was just about production of information, it wouldn't need to be done properly. Yeah. Right? They could have a public line open 24 7 mm -hmm. with right? They could call themselves and get representatives. Mm -hmm. and get and as our governors are doing, and I'm sure they're doing that yeah. between them, right? So the public aspect of it sort of tells me that it's probably more about the signaling Absolutely. Role, right, rather than actual information gathering. 100%. And that is kind of the second half of the book is to looking at what is this signaling? What is What are the signals that are being conveyed? And does it actually influence attitudes of the regime? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, no. It's like, but this is yeah. So like, there are multiple components, right? I'm I'm presenting some of them. I'll present that aspect at the last part of the presentation because I think that's really what got me interested, right? What got me interested was like, I was sitting down. I was I was very sad doing my field work. Uh, I had run into some problems, and I was sitting in my my dorm and watching the direct line. And I was like, this is stupid. This is just what are they doing? And then I went. I talked to my friends, and like, oh no, this is great. This is a, an awesome way. This is like how problems are solved. We're so thankful for Putin. He listens to us, he cares, and he solves problems. And I was like, you guys think so? And so what got me into this is like, what's the public nature of it? And so that's why I spend a whole lot of time uh, actually trying to test that. Who is it impacting? Um, and so I'll get to that right after I get to through points two and three on the information management. Um, but so we, we kind of already talked about this. We kind of talked about how this is a monitoring and accountability tool. but my favorite example of this, an illustration of this, is this, this meme that goes uh, around, uh, makes the rounds on social media every year um, on the direct line. And it shows the speed at which different objects move. As you can see, a bullet travels slower than the speed of light, which travels slower still than officials rushing to fulfill their duties before the direct line with Vladimir Putin, <laughs> right? So this is making fun, but pointing out to the fact that this is a way for Putin to publicly call out name and shame officials. In fact, there was one instance, I think it was maybe, maybe the governor of Omsk, I can't recall at the moment, where there was a rumor that after he got publicly chastised on the direct line when he was sitting around, that he had been fired to the point where his uh, press secretary had to put out a statement being like, no, no, no. Like he's not fired, he's still in his job. Yes, Putin yelled at him a little bit, but everything's okay. He ended up being fired. Um, <laughs> um, and so in the last bit is this very much this public narrative part, right? This is a great way um, for authorities to shape the political narrative and specifically the image of who Putin is to the public, right? So of the millions of questions that allegedly get asked, right, they choose only a handful. They get to choose those 80 or 90 or whatever they may be. So organizers have a whole lot of control over the course of the broadcast, how it actually plays out. And the, one of the things that it does is it is trying to reinforce this image, this public image of Putin as kind of a man of the people, as somebody who, uh, you know, is listening to his constituents who cares about what they think and is actively trying to solve their problems. Um, so this is from a couple of my two surveys that I ran. Um, I asked people like, what do you think the purpose of the drum line is, right? And so as you can see, getting back to your question at the beginning, a plurality of people think that this is genuinely a way for the government to learn about concerns of society. Over around 40-ish percent. Um, a number of people also think that this is a great way for the government to actually inform people about their own policy, right? As a way to convey what are their priorities. Um, 
But then there is also this group here at the end, small but growing, of people who think that this is kind of just a, a circus, a way for Putin to improve his ratings. So we have this dynamic, we have this tension going on. Yes. Is there a reason why they would do it monthly? I'm just trying to understand if you're if you're going to this like public signaling, yeah, with doing it more often, mm -hmm. further strengthen the power of the public yeah. signal, would it undermine it? Yeah, because there's room for too many questions or yeah. the sense of why they're doing more often if it seems to be so I think it's just kind of the time commitment, right? The time and the resources that it takes. This is, takes, you know, Putin's four or five hours on um, Putin's day, but he says he like, um, does this for prepares all weekend for it. So I think it's mostly having to do with how much time commitment it is. However, as I hope to demonstrate in the last part of the presentation, I think it could actually be a bad thing if they did it too often. Because if they're like, well, Putin is like listening here, but you know, we had his address two months ago. He said he was going to solve a problem. We still haven't pro solved it. People are going to start asking questions. Um, yes. So, but now I want to address kind of Arturs' question, kind of the second main question of the book, which is like, does this actually do anything? Right? We've got some benefits through this various information management techniques, but does it actually impact attitudes? Yes. Um, do you have any sense of what Actual lower level officials relate to threat line to be. Sorry? Um, do you have any sense of what lower level officials relate to threat line to be? Like, do they see that as, yeah, if we were doing our job, we were going to get strange at that, or do they actually know that, like, yeah, that's the thing you just call actually selecting to get strange this, this year? So based off of my interviews, like with one of us, for people who, who work on this topic, um, one of the things that they mentioned is that uh, lower level officials are, are actually a little nervous about this, that they know if, you know, you, if you're a favorite of Putin, right, you're, you're going to be okay. He's only going to selectively call people out. But that still, if you're perhaps not in the best favor, this could be a way for him to publicly punish you or maybe even ask you. Um, so there is that sense as well um, amongst officials that this could potentially be a monitoring tool and perhaps even an accountability tool as well. Yeah. Yes, but like they will, they will be nervous no matter how like their actions lead to consequences during this threat. Oh, sure. Right? And if they, if there is no connection, yeah. they're still nervous because they're afraid of for their jobs, like the corruption of the forever. Like, how is that an accountability? Mm -hmm. Just there, like, you know, no matter what we do, we we might just think as uh, we might not think we are like this is mm -hmm. because it's a very easy public way of doing so, right? It gives the like Putin almost an excuse to be like, I got so many questions from your region. You're doing a bad job. Uh, answer that right now. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, okay, you're fired, <laughs> right? Um, so it's again this kind of public a public mechanism that just makes it a little bit easier, but also very, very much increases the monitoring ability. Um, so I think that's the most key point here. So to get to the question of how does awareness actually influence attitudes, um, what I do here is I, I rely first on my interviews, but then on these two nationally representative surveys that I conducted and I embedded uh, experiments within them. Um, I know you're very much running out of time, so I'm not gonna show you results. I'm just gonna talk to you about, about my findings. Um, and so in these experiments, I use information priming um, mechanisms. So I use half of my people or my control group. They get no mention of the direct line. The other half, I just mentioned, I was like, hey, have you, do you, have you heard of this before? So I asked them, do you know what it is? I'm not asking if they participate in it, if they watch it, just reminding them that this program exists. That's all I'm doing here. So if you're interested in the results, the experimental results have been published in an article on comparative political studies. So if you just can't wait for the book to come out, you really want to dive into this more detail, it's all there. Um, and I'd also be you know, happy to talk about it um, in more detail if we do have time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very straightforward. It's like a five point Likert scale of do you approve of his job, of the job he's doing as president? Which is the standard question that is asked for, has always been asked for approval in Russia. So it's for it's for form, so I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. How is he doing in his job as president? Like, do you approve of Vladimir Putin in his job as president? Yeah. Or prime minister. 
Um, yes, it did. So I'll go to that next. Yeah. Um, so briefly, just the findings of this. So what I find is that on average, being reminded about the existence of the direct line, again, not watching it, not participating in it, just being reminded that it exists, has a positive impact on, first off, on peeling, uh, people's perception of voice. They think people who are primed with the direct line treatment are more likely to think that the government actually cares about their needs and concerns. This is about a three to four percentage point increase between people in the control and treatment groups. Moreover, I find that it actually does directly improve, improve approval of Putin. So people who are reminded of the direct line have more positive feelings about Putin than those who do not. Again, about a four percentage point increase. Yes. So I, I try to get at that in various ways. So, I mean, in general, we are very confident, at least at that time, it's changed at this point in Russia with everything going on, that there's not a lot of preference falsification. But I asked this in a number of different ways through the different experiments to try to tease out, and it doesn't appear that there is much preference falsification. Before you showed us the results, where like most of the people were aware of the direct lining existing. So just like generally, do you think that direct lining is like persuading anyone, or is it just Finding support that's already in the system, okay, prior like this, prior to the people watching or the finding. So, amongst people who are watching, exactly. So, is it not, is it persuading or is it just like making more salient the people, you know, already felt the need? So, so I, I get at the average, uh, the heterogeneous treatment effects, I get at the conditional effects as well. Okay. So, first off, there's really no difference between. I, I specifically am not asking only people who watched it or like on view. I am asking everybody. So it's a very, very weak treatment. So if like some people are more likely to have been watching it one group versus the other, that means this is a conservative estimate. But what I do find is that there's really no difference among these, these groups. Yes. Yeah. What is the effect of not this participatory technology, but the effect of Putin himself? So I think the reason why. I, I address that um, in the experiments, and I have Putin being mentioned in every single one, so it's not just like a Putin mention. Um, so I include him in all of this. The only difference is how he's finding out about the information. And so one of the important parts here is that, so one of the questions I always get, and one of the questions I always ask my respondents is like, is this just a, I'm, you think that this is solving problems, right? Is this a voice thing, or is this a responsiveness thing? And so I try to get at this, I get at this in the experiment by directly having the primes being the question, the issue that I prompt was solved and the issue I prompt was not solved. And what I find is regardless of whether or not people actually saw any results of the direct line, we still see this bump in perception of voice um, and approval. So regardless of whether or not people are actually getting what they want, that are actually getting the government to do their job, we are still seeing a direct increase in how people perceive their own place in the political process, or at least express their own place in the political process. So, but I want to go back to these quotes that I showed you in this graph that I showed you, right? So what we see here is that, you know, there is very much a tension um, in society between people who, like Maxine over here, they're like, yeah, this is actually a genuine way for the government to learn about society's concerns, to give uh, their message, that this is an actual democratic way of, of kind of uh, allowing people to talk to their, to their government, uh, government. And the people over here, like Andre, who are in this group, right? That this is a show only meant to approve, uh, improve Putin's ratings. And so what I try to ask, and one of the things I was wondering, are what are these individual characteristics that are leading some people to buy into it and then other people not to? And so I argue that how people interpret the direct line um, and subsequently um, its impact on both perceptions of voice and approval uh, of Putin is going to be conditional on two main things. First off, on political sophistication. Are people interested in politics? Do they participate in politics, right? 
And then also on their uh, political priors, what are their political briefs? Are they generally more pro-regime or generally anti-regime? And so essentially I'm diving into the heterogeneous treatment effects here. Um, again, it's in the CPS article if you want to look, but I will show you the findings briefly. I think I saw a hand, yes. Yeah, um, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt your mid-sentence, but uh, did you ask any similar questions about, for instance, like the State of the Union? Because mm -hmm. what I'm curious about here is whether like these people who are skeptical of this are going to respond that way to any sort of like yeah. public statement type of or whether this like increases their, their Reactive. Yeah, so I don't ask about other addresses of the line, but I have no prior beliefs that they would affect, at, at the very least, this idea of voice, which is really the thing I'm most concerned about, because there is no mechanism through which people have any voice through these other speeches. Um, yeah. At, at one moment, it would be interesting to know if, like, the State of the Union has a more moderate response, but mm. you could drive it to either, oh, like, like right. positive or very Oh, positive. yeah, absolutely. I think so. And I'll show you, like, what ended up happening, um, which I think is quite interesting, which was a whole heck of a lot of polarization um, going on. So, so for the conditional effects, what I find, just very briefly, is that priming awareness of the direct line increases approval, right, and perceptions of voice, but primarily for a, regime supporters, people who are already like pro-regime in some ways, and people with low levels of political sophistication. People are like, I'm not really interested in politics. I don't get involved. I don't vote. I don't do any of this. So it is specifically for this group that we are really seeing a positive impact. And in fact, for people with higher level sophistication, those who are kind of more aware of what's going on in the political system, we don't see anything. It's very much a null effect. But one of the things I thought was quite interesting, and I think is evidence of a frustration effect here, is that awareness of the direct line actually decreases approval for and, and, and perception of the voice for regime opponents, right? So after they were primed about the direct line, people said that they were less likely to think that the government cared about them and their concerns. And so what I think is going on here is that People are essentially, when you prime them, you know, it's reinforcing this idea that there's really no genuine pluralism, that this is a show, and that not only are is there no voice, but the, the voice doesn't do anything. And so what we end up seeing is that these participatory technologies are not converting anybody. Rather, they're kind of reinforcing and strengthening support, specifically among people who are already predisposed in the government's favor. Um, and I think this speaks to a lot of current trends that we are seeing in Russia. So, but when I originally fielded these surveys, when I did my first round of interv um, interviews and participant observation, the number of people in kind of this pro-regime camp was about 90% of my sample, right? So in that case, this backlash that we saw isn't really gonna matter much. If I was Putin, I'd be like, if this is like helping me with 90% of the population, I'll take that gamble, right? But things are changing quite a bit. So I went back in 2019, I did a series of, of conducted more interviews. And what I found now is that people are becoming increasingly skeptical and increasingly frustrated over the existence of the direct line, but also these appeal systems and whatnot. So at this point, the direct line has been going on for well over 20 years. And every year, people ask the same questions. Every year, they're asking about potholes, right? Potholes maybe have moved down the street a little bit, but it's the same exact issue that comes up. And so people are getting tired of this, feeling like it is just a formality that doesn't actually influence anything. It's not resulting in any types of change. So I think this, again, once again, is evidence of a frustration effect. This idea that voice that is perceived to ultimately not have any influence can be more detrimental in some ways than not having any voice at all. So as more and more people get tired of these supposed avenues of participation, right? Not only will the legitimation benefits of this wane, but it could actually end up backfiring and hurting the regime in the long term. So in the last few minutes, um, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the um, implications and contributions. So when, how are we on time? Do we go to 15? Okay, great, perfect. Um, so I have a little time to talk about kind of some, of some of the broad implications of this project. So 
one of the most common ways, right? Authoritarian regimes come to power through the ballot box by, by people voting them in. It's also one of the ways that they get out of power. So as a result, convincing people that the government actually deserves to be there, that they care about their citizens and working on their behalf is really an important component of regime durability. And so the major goal of, of this project with my research in general is to better understand how authoritarian regimes can construct these different opportunities for communication um, to help shore up their regimes if they do so. And importantly, I think, is addressing the ways that they don't work. And in fact, the ways that they can actually be detrimental to regimes. Russia, I think, is, has been particularly good in this regard, both because they've used these strategies for literally hundreds of years, but have also been one of the main innovators um, amongst co contemporary authoritarian regimes. A lot of countries copy Russia's different strategies, whether it be their online appeal system, their direct line. Um, my favorite example of this is in Kazakhstan, they held for a number of years a program called, wait for it, the direct line of Nusultan Nazarbayev, the former president, that was identical like down to the layout of the studio, right? So people are looking towards Russia um, and how they're doing this and whether or not it's working. And so I focused on a specific example today, right, of this direct line. In the book, I go into a lot more detail about these different types of participatory technologies, whether they be the online appeal systems, the public um, consultations, both in Russia and outside. But I feel like so often in our studies of, of political participation, um, we tend to focus either on participation directly or on participants, right? People actually getting involved and who gets involved. Um, but the fact of the matter is that I think most people don't really actively get involved in politics in any meaningful way. You may go out and vote, but other than that, are you actually doing much? And so moreover, what participation and engagement looks like in various contexts, I think varies a lot. So one of the things that I think this book shows is that the potential scope of impact is much larger than we typically give credit for. The direct line I demonstrate is not influencing approval or perceptions of voice or attitudes among people that are actively involved in it, right? It's just those who hear about it that we see some movements and attitudes. And so what this implies is that authoritarian regimes don't necessarily need to directly encourage people to participate in politics, but rather just to convince people that they have some opportunity for input should they wish to take advantage of it, that it exists, that it is out there for them. So this is implying that awareness, not just participation matters. I'm sorry, did I see a hand in the back? Yes, please go ahead. Um, so you're basically saying that there is now like through persuasive quality to the thing that like supporters, the support mm -hmm. still um gain. And uh but I think that like some people might believe that like yeah, Putin is lying, this is an account mm -hmm. show. But so many of my contractors actually believe in this. Yeah, yeah. So probably I shouldn't go take it to the street because they all, <laughs> all love yeah. this, you know, like yeah. their ears. And um, like, do you think that there is some effect on the uh, regime opponents mm -hmm. in the sense that they start to believe that um, their contractors are actually, you know, affected by this? Mm, yeah. So, so this is a great question. So it's like essentially they're like downstream effects, right? I think there is to a point. So um, I believe it was Andre, the skeptical person that I showed you earlier. Um, he, was, he was really interesting. Um, so he was totally against this direct line thing. He's like, this is such a circus. It is such a performance. It doesn't really matter. And I was like, it's like but you know, actually, I had a friend who asked a question on the direct line. They didn't show him the direct line. But a couple of weeks later, she got like a, a phone call from an official and saying, don't worry, we got you. And they solved her problem. So yes, maybe it kind of does work, but no, 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 it's just a performance. So I think there is this kind of tension there where if you are seeing people around you being convinced, right, maybe this is also doing something at work. The results show at least on the aggregate, it's probably having more of a negative effect. But based off of my interviews, I think there, yeah, I think there is kind of more of a tension than the survey results necessarily show. Because I think one of the, again, one of the more important implications is like, not everybody's going to react in the same way, right? 
everybody is going to have or different categories of individuals are going to have different uh, you know responses to this. So kind of to get back to like my original question of like, does this work at all? The answer is, I mean, it does, but only to a point, right? As I showed, this is these participatory technologies, they're not converting critics necessarily, right? Rather, they're reinforcing support that already exists among those that, you know, are already more favorably predisposed. And so for authoritarian regimes, as long as that group is a relatively substantial part of the population, then participatory technologies are probably a really good bet. They don't actually take that much time and resources comparatively, but they could potentially have a pretty big impact. But because ultimately we do see this polarization, this even farther driving between the pro and anti-regime groups, as discontent grows, the efficacy of these mechanisms are most likely going to wane. And in fact, what we have seen over the past couple of years is uh, the regime has been less and less willing to hold the direct lines. They didn't do it. They have never done it in times of a lot of discord. So they didn't hold it in 2012 when Putin, um, in the midst of you know, really big anti-regime protests, they didn't hold it in 2020 during COVID. They didn't hold it last year um, after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. I think there's probably, everybody I've been talking to has been saying whether or not they hold it this year is going to be totally depending on the situation on the ground. Does it look like Russia's doing an okay job in Ukraine and Putin can confidently go up? Or is he going to get, is this going to be, you know, something that could even make more of a backlash against Putin. And so I think this kind of, this increase in like negative attitudes, this tiring of the direct line is very much something we're seeing, right? In Russia, we are seeing that these, you know, participatory technologies, which are very much a hallmark of informational autocracies. Um, so these Guryev and um, you know, uh, terminology, they, we've seen in Russia a replacement of these with much more, you know, turn towards repression. Um, so I'm not, obviously, I'm not proposing that to explain repressive, Russia's repressive turn is because of this, but rather I think it does give us some insights into how stable or maybe how not stable these uh, informational autocracies that use a lot of these so-called forms of democratic participation can actually be, at least in the long term. Yeah, Sasha. But Russia, so you're saying the presidential yeah. so more than they mm -hmm. were before the war. Yeah. So it's not that like the public is like no longer complaining about their problem. No, but I think the like the different uh mechanisms, different versions of these, right? It's like the direct line may become tired. And so they might need to turn to something else. And so that's why we don't see typically in most countries that I've looked at, we don't see just one type of these. We see all of these different varieties because they can all try to get at these problems in slightly different ways that people may be more or less willing to buy into. Um, so I think that is definitely one of the things that work. Yeah. I saw, I, sorry, I saw another hand. Or maybe not. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to stop here, um, but I'd be welcome uh, any more questions uh, that you all may have. Yes, please go ahead. Question to see if I, um, the way I stated is a good way of summarizing the argument. So some people really like Putin for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and they don't like liking an autocrat. So this gives them a reason to justify to themselves, like, well, he's not really an autocrat because there's actually voice. It could not, it could, could not explain why only amongst people who really like him. So, so, mm -hmm. So it's it allows them to like swallow what they probably ultimately know, which is like, oh, well, yeah, sure, this one gives us reasons to feel better about liking Putin, or it's not about this. They genuinely, even though it's a performance, but then they genuinely believe it's listening to them and they don't think it's a performance. I think it's the latter. Like amongst the people, and again, these are kind of low sophistication as well as like more pro regime people, like based off of all of my conversations over the 20 months. And uh, dozens and dozens of interviews, they generally seem to be like, no, this is like, we are a democracy. <laughs> this is an evidence of that, right? This is a great way through which the government is actually caring about us and listening to us. This doesn't seem to be a way of, we understand it's an authoritarian regime, but we're swallowing this pill. Um, there seems to be, at least the way that they express it is much more genuine. Yes, our choice. 
Oh, sure. Steve Barnes is asking many of these same participatory technologies you used in the model. Yeah. What makes them different? Mm -hmm. so again, yeah. Maybe so I think, so I don't, I actually do address this in the book. Um, it's something that is going to be part of my follow-up project is that participatory technologies, they aren't just used in non-democracies, they kind of originated in non-democracies. These are like, as we know, contemporary authoritarian regimes, they like to borrow democratic, quote unquote, democratic practices. And in fact, that is one of the ways in which they can portray themselves as actually like adhering to the role of the people. Why do authoritarian regimes use elections? This is supposed to be a dem democratic thing. Well, because they can give them another, another avenue of control. So one of the, the beneficial, most beneficial things about participatory technologies is because they give such control to the regime to control what participation looks like, what communication looks like, it allows, it gives them a lot of freedom, right? These do not constrain elites, they enable elite behavior. And so they can absolutely can and are used in democracies, non-democracies throughout the world. It's all about the intent, right? An authoritarian. Just, actually, just what would be an example of closest example of direct buying in a democracy? Oh, sure. Uh, so, so Obama actually held a version of the direct line during his presidency on YouTube. It was primarily aimed at like younger people, but he's like, I'm going to sit here on YouTube, ask me questions, let's talk about your concerns, right? So we actually do see these. You can also think of town halls as being like a very common thing that we see. Um, yeah, these are not inherent to authoritarian regimes at all. They are a way for authoritarian regimes to like gain control by looking democratic. Yes. So follow up to that. So we have these politicians in democracy. It's yeah. also true that you have a lot of orientation and someone can talk to a man and be of the right. So I guess the question really to that is, is the difference, I mean, it seems to me that a lot of your argument could also apply to the way that politicians are using democracy. The difference that you're seeing can be looking for something else. So if I understood why that you said, I have a sample of growth. So it seems like that is like a large difference in that can be used as a body mechanism. Because I mean, it seems like in the democracy, it's also good that you can use these for um, great management, for the yeah. information, and a lot of the results we did see. So there's actually been a lot of research um, done on, on these types of deliberative practices. Um, it's, it's the line of literature on deliberative democracy, um, which is very similar. And what's interesting, um, and I haven't personally done research in this area in, in democracies, but it's interesting that most of the results from my understanding show that there's really is not that much of an impact on people's attitudes or political efficacy. And the reason that the authors state is, is primarily because in democracies, there's just so many ways that you could potentially contact the government, right? You have free and fair elections, you have town halls, you have all these different ways. And so adding any particular one version of this isn't going to do much. But in non-democracies, when you don't really have many options, you're going to see much more of an impact because it's kind of showing you there is opportunity for voice when there aren't all of these number of different avenues available to you. Um, yes, sorry. There, perhaps I missed it, but is there any evidence that the presidential administration really collects the like, complaints and concerns of citizens and try to mm -hmm. address them? Yeah, so a couple of different ways. So as I mentioned, uh, they actually collect and put together this like uh, this green folder that they give to um, officials throughout the year. They constantly refer back to, here is a question that came up in the questions on the direct line, not that was on the program. Here's how we are solving it. They post after the fact, they post um, kind of like a, a memo that says, here are the main issues that came up over the broadcast. Again, through the 3 million that allegedly get asked. Um, unaddressed questions, right? Unaddressed questions, things that are not on the broadcast, but were um, submitted through the direct the line. Evidence, so, yeah. Validated so they, or what? Sorry? Validated evidence or like, is that in your view? Yeah, so both people I've interviewed, but again, the government is publishing all of this information throughout the year saying here are things that were addressed on the direct line, that were submitted through the direct line. So I don't know if they are necessarily, you know, making any systemic changes. My guess is no, I'm not seeing any evidence of that. But as part of the book, I actually go through and compile a very long list of every piece of um, evidence I can find of here was a mention of the direct line in like a newspaper article and here was the issue that got solved um, and very few of these were actually addressed on the like live on the air. Can they be manipulated? 
Sure, I'm sure they could, absolutely. But again, that's like less of a concern, right? Um, I, I'm concerned more about what we actually see because that is what is going to have any type of persuasive impact, not on the stuff behind the scenes. And that's, again, one of the benefits. The input to us, we don't see the input. We only see the output. But then it doesn't, doesn't solve the, the pages dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. Since they don't get the real information from citizens. Again, but, while we think that's like maybe some of the information is fabricated, I, based off of all of my, my field work and my interviews, most people believe that they are getting at least like in the millions of questions um, and that they're actually looking at them. Yeah, again, I can't test this directly because it is opaque, right? They are deliberately not showing this to us, um, but that is something I do look at quite extensively in the book. Yes, uh, Sasha, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Okay, so, okay. so given that we're in a situation where yeah. there's not lots of direct ways in which the reader communicates with the citizens, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, if the significance of the direct line is not so much in its effect on support mm -hmm. for the leader, and and not not so much that it's something else. It's like it's just getting back to my the comment that I had before about that trying to get they're trying to signal to their lower tier official yeah. areas, areas that they have their their own means of getting mm -hmm. information from citizens. Okay, you're you're focused on the impacts on public support, the improvement of public perceptions of whether it's doing a good job, et cetera, but maybe that's just all ancillary. Mm -hmm. And the real driver of this is the desire to monitor and to fish out. And so maybe if you take that a step further, mm -hmm. it's possible that something changed around the time of 2001 when the direct line, uh, I think it was established in 2001. So maybe there's something, something that changed in the relationship between Putin and the lower tier business that meant that he needed this extra way of soliciting citizens' complaints. And I wonder also if you look at the variation like within the cross section of variation of where that complaints come from over yeah. time. And that's sort of a hypothesis, but I think it'd be really interesting to yeah. guess. Because if it's about support, then presumably when they support, like you could reason that when they instituted the very line, Putin should also be instituting a lot of other mechanisms through which to get support. Mm -hmm. And if it's if he's not, and it's not like it's not something like this is kind of very distinctive, then maybe this is just like a form and some other border yeah. story. Yeah. So first off, I in the book, one of the things I'm very careful to do is I address here are the various ways that I see this at work. I do not make any you know, specific arguments. I think one of these reasons are more important than the other. Again, I think one of the benefits is that it has all of these multiple aspects to it. Um, as a uh, in, uh, the question about it, what changed between like 2000 and 2001, Putin came to power in 2000, right? So he basically started this from the beginning. Um, so there wasn't like some change. It was something that was started very, very early in his presidency. Um, and they have tried a number of different uh, of these versions of these participants. Some have been more uh, useful than others. In fact, in 2004, the reason they didn't hold the direct line is because uh, the government announced that they were done. They're like, this is not actually, we don't care, we did it, it was good, everyone enjoyed it, but we're gonna move on, we're gonna try something else. And there was such a public out, like, outrage about that that they instituted it again the next year. And that they did. But they have done a number of different things. So the, for example, they have a presidential complaint system. Sasha has done some really great research on that that they do. Um, I showed you all those examples at the beginning of the presentation. The thing is, is that the direct line has been the most public, right? Because it directly ties Putin to the question. Um, and so it is in that way, I think, been the most influential, the most.
absolutely. I mean, I think this is, is, is very much the case, right? This is kind of <laughs> the decree comes down from above, right? You've got the good czar, bad boyers, and the, uh, Putin is using this as an opportunity to be like, here's how things will go. So I absolutely think that this is a way to kind of, again, control this conversation, control what is actually going on in the political system. So he sure. does things that the yeah. government cannot do. Yeah, like, yeah, they do. Uh, I think that's a, that's a question of like why he says some things. So one of the things that's interesting, one of the uh, things that came up a lot in my interviews is people are like, you know, he's so smart. He's so good at having a grasp of every aspect of politics from potholes to pensions to whatever. Um, like to the point where like, even when I watch it, I'm like, oh, how did he just pull that number out of the air? And then I'll Google it and like, oh, that's a number that's out of the air. Like he's <laughs> literally making things up. Um, and so, so I think that happens quite often. Um, I don't know if this is just, you know, this is a four hour program and he is just trying to sound super, you know, competent, which I think is part of it. Or if this is him, you know, so if, is he making mistakes or is this actively him saying, you know, we have to do something even when they can't. I think that, yeah, I think that's something to think more about for sure. All right, so they're out of time. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your questions. I appreciate it.